my name is Ryan Salazar and I am a middle school and high school math teacher at the Jefferson County Somerset Charter School. And today I'm going to be discussing the qualities of effective instruction in middle school. And I've organized my presentation into four sections based on the Florida Educator Accomplished Practices. The first section is going to be about instructional design, the next is going to be about learning environment, then instructional delivery, and assessment. And at the very end I have a summary. And in each category I'm going to discuss a couple elements that contribute to effective instruction. So to begin with the instructional design. Part of the instructional design includes the construction of learning objectives and sequencing of material. Learning objectives. In middle school as throughout all grades, learning objectives are important and many teachers fall into the routine of creating learning objectives, but I think it's easy to forget the purpose and the value of learning objectives. And the Dean 2012 book says that learning objectives are important because it promotes self-regulated learning. It gives students an opportunity to know what they're learning and to monitor their progress toward that learning goal. Marzano provides several verbs for learning objectives because it's important to give the students an understanding of what actions they're going to participate in in order to learn the material for that day. So these are verbs from Marzano's 2009 book, um, such as students will make, students will defend, students will predict, students will solve, research, etc. And these verbs give the students a clear idea of what they're going to be doing during the lesson in order to extend their learning. Marzano also explains the difference between two different kinds of knowledge, that being declarative knowledge and procedural knowledge. Declarative knowledge is fact-based content, and procedural knowledge are processes or skills that students will demonstrate or develop during a lesson. And Marzano suggests two different ways to phrase learning objectives based on the type of knowledge. For declarative knowledge, um, he suggests starting students will understand particular facts about a topic, for example. Or for procedural knowledge, students will be able to solve a particular problem. And those are the learning objectives. And that is a part of the instructional design. Another part of the instructional design that is important is the sequencing of learning. Scaffolding is a psychological concept uh, discussed by Vygotsky, and Vygotsky specifically suggests that when people learn, they start in their zone of proximal development, and that's important for teachers to know what students' abilities are in order to scaffold learning, to build students' learning and ability so that they can independently achieve more challenging concepts in the future. So sequencing starts with what students know and gradually builds so that they can achieve more and more challenging more and more challenging material in the future. Advanced organizers. Dean 2012 says that advanced organizers are effective to give students an understanding of where they are and how their knowledge is going to build into the future. For example, different types of organizers include graphic organizers, which would be pictures, narrative organizers, which would be um, things like um, stories, expository organizers, which would be verbal or written descriptions, of students learning, and I'm going to give you an example of graphic organizers um, in a few slides. Dean 2012 says the more students know about a topic, the more interested they will be in it. And that really hits on the point of sequencing and providing learning objectives, is that if students have an understanding of the topic, if they realize how their learning ties in to their new learning that they're going to be engaged in, they'll be more interested and more able to contribute as effective learners throughout the lesson. Now to move on to the next part of um, the effective instruction in middle school is the learning environment. The, in this case, the learning environment is not just the physical environment. I'm going to be talking more about the culture or the climate in the classroom. And Marzano, in his 2007 book, says that a teacher's beliefs about students' chances of success impacts the way that teacher interacts with that student. And the way that the teacher interacts with the student then impacts that student's ability to be successful. So it's important that in constructing a learning environment that teachers are careful 
um, to keep a strong focus on academic success and also to provide opportunities for students to be independent learners to self-regulate their learning. The focus on academic success. The question is how do we communicate um, high expectations and create a culture of, of academic success in the classroom? Well, Marzano suggests that there are a few ways that teachers implicitly communicate their expectations of individual students. Um, we do that through questioning, through our use of time, through our verbal communication and our nonverbal communication. Take questioning, for example. Marzano's research suggests that teachers who have high expectations of students will give them more challenging questions and will give them more time to really um, think about the questions and try and figure out what the question, what the answer is. However, when teachers have low expectations of students, they give them perhaps easier questions and they don't give the students as much time to really think about and really come to terms with what that question is asking um, and how to answer it. Teachers will often interrupt or give the answer to students if they have low expectations and don't think that they can achieve that. So questioning and time are really two important ways that teachers start to communicate their expectations of what students can achieve. Now, verbal and nonverbal communication. Verbal communication is perhaps the strongest way of communi communicating expectations for academic success, but it's also a subtle indicator. For example, um, a teacher's tone of voice or their, their expressions can often communicate to a child whether or not that teacher holds high expectations or not. And nonverbal communication, things like gesture, smiling, eye contact, all convey to the student implicitly whether or not that teacher has high expectations. So it's important to consider these four things when constructing an effective learning environment. Also, culturally relevant pedagogy, which is described by many researchers, especially Lads and Billings, uh, and culturally relevant pedagogy begins on the premise of academic success, that students have to be held to a high standard and the belief that all students can succeed. This quote says that effective teachers model a belief and high expectations for all students where failure is not accepted as an option. And that comes from the Young 2010 article that is about culturally relevant pedagogy and trying to eliminate the, the achievement gap. But especially students at the bottom of the gap need very high expectations and teachers need to model that failure is not an option in the learning environment. Now we've discussed instructional design, the learning environment, and now I'm going to touch on instructional delivery and facilitation. And two elements of instructional delivery that I want to talk about are communication and differentiation. Communication, especially in middle school, um, needs to extend beyond verbal communication. Many teachers like to do what I'm doing now and stand at the front of the classroom and just speak to students. Um, and that is not always an effective method of instruction. It's important to provide non-linguistic representation such as images because Dean 2012 says that non-linguistic representations help students to understand knowledge at a deeper level and to recall it much more easily. It gives students something visually to grab onto and perhaps to recall it differently, perhaps if they're, not, um, if they're visual learners and not, um, um, not oral learners. Now, other methods of, um, of non-linguistic representation include graphic organizers, manipulatives, mental pictures and illustrations. Here's an example of a graphic organizer that I referred to earlier. And this could be used as an advanced organizer to show students how their previous learning links with what the new learning is for that day. So for example, if today's learning is about solving linear equations, I can give the students an example of what that looks like. And they might not know what to do, but if I show them how this links to their past learning, they might have something to grab onto and realize that they can achieve the more challenging task. For example, students at this point in time would know about the distributive property. I would have already taught um, adding and subtracting integers, evaluating expressions, and then I can show that builds on even more prerequisite knowledge, such as um, being able to multiply and find the greatest common factor, properties of negative numbers, etc. So this is the way that a graphic organizer can be um, used in the classroom to show students how their previous learning links to their new learning for that day. And that's an important method of communication. Other methods of communication include higher order questioning, um, such as tiered questioning, 
which Dean 2012 suggests looks something like this, starting with more basic concepts such as questioning about names and objects and events, and then going to more deeper questions such as reflecting, structuring, and deepening conceptual understanding. Another type of questioning is analytical questioning, analyzing errors, analyzing different perspectives. And this is a page from one of my math books that I like to use with my sixth graders. And it shows students two different ways of solving the same question. For example, this is about greatest common factor. And Isabel has a way of doing it, and Eric has a way of solving the question. And I encourage students to look at both ways, to compare and contrast, and to decide which method they prefer. And that really gives them a chance to try and understand their learning at a deeper level. And that questioning, that source of communication, gives students to talk with each other about what they prefer um, and to create some different tools that they can use to solve questions. Now the last type of communication that I'm going to touch on is reciprocal teaching. Giving students the chance to engage with each other. Not just focusing on teacher to student, but student to student communication as well. Where students have the chance to communicate with each other, to question, to summarize, to predict, are all effective methods of communication and instructional delivery. Now differentiation um, is a very broad topic, but I'm going to talk about um, the use of multisensory activities. Um, middle school teachers sometimes tend to shy away from using multisensory activities, things like movement, things like um, manipulative tactile senses. Those are things that uh, elementary school teachers are really good at, and sometimes we lose in middle school, and it's important that we don't lose these things, because there's a lot of research to suggest that when students move around, they're able to learn and to activate different parts of the brain that will help them to recall information again in the future. So using movement in the classroom, using audio and visual media, this is a good um, example. This presentation is a good example of um, visual media, not such a great um, example of audio media, though, that can be used. And then tactile senses, um, giving students the chance to manipulate objects, to really um, to feel and move um, and use their um, spatial awareness to develop their learning. Technology is perhaps my favorite source of differentiation because it really gives students the opportunity to control the pace of their learning. This is an example of an account that I created on Khan Academy that I use with uh, many of my students. And I'm able to assign assignments to the students and they can really um, pace their learning. They can um, spend more time on um, topics that are more challenging for them. They can access videos and, and um, audio resources and other online manipulatives to help deepen their learning. And then they can accelerate through things that are perhaps um, more simple for them. So I, I often find that differentiation through technology is a very effective um, tool. Now we've touched on the first three um, accomplished practices, the instructional design, learning environment, delivery, and now assessment. And in terms of assessment, I'm really talking about giving students information about their performance so that they can improve. I think that many students, especially as they get into middle school, are very concerned about what grade they're receiving. Did I get an A? Did I get a B? And I think that assessment is much more, uh, is much deeper than that, and that, in the sense that it should really give students information so that they can choose to improve their, their performance. And there are a few ways that we do that. Providing student feedback. We need to focus not only on the um, outcome, the summative assessment, the grade that students get, but also on growth and progress. Hoy and Hoy 2013 say that feedback emphasizing progress is the most effective. By helping students to understand how they're growing and what they need to do to grow more really uh, encourages them to focus on the effort that they're putting in, which is the second point here. That students need to develop the belief that the harder they work, the smarter they will get. And that's from Dean 2012. And effort is something that I've found um, can be challenging to describe to middle schoolers, because many middle schoolers, at least the ones that I 